Welcome to part 6 of my series about soft tubes modular. Today I'm going to talk about the ADSR module dubbed for A140. But a short note first. Please listen also to those uh, some words at the end and don't just uh, skip them. Thank you. ADSR, oh how boring, I beg your pardon, is there anybody out there who doesn't know everything about ADSR envelope generators? You may ask yourself these questions and well, perhaps, perhaps, yes, indeed, you know everything about ADSRs, but perhaps you might not and perhaps you uh, do not, sorry, and perhaps you might not have thought about some special questions concerning ADSR envelopes for some time at least not. All right, the pure functionality at first. Each of the four components of the envelope has a knob of its own to adjust the individual component. The attack, which determines the time the signal needs to get from zero to maximum when the gate signal reaches the ADSR module. The decay, which determines the time the signal needs to get from maximum down to the sustain level the sustain level itself, which is the signal's level for the rest of the time as long as there is a gate signal, and release, which determines the time the signal needs to fall back to zero when the gate signal ends, or better, after the gate signal has ended. The gate signal can come from my keyboard via the MIDI to CV module. Please listen and watch the output level meter. Or I can use the LFO to set the ADSR in action. So far the knobs, now for the jacks. The uppermost input jack is the input for the gate signal. For example, the gate signal from the MIDI to CV module or the square wave from an LFO module. Or some signals you might not think of at once, but well, more about that later in this video when I talk about the details. The jack right below gate is meant to force the ADSR to start a new envelope at once when a trigger signal is fed in here, even if the actual envelope hasn't developed through all of its stages yet. Please listen and watch to the difference. The C5 starts the envelope with a quite long attack and decay. The following notes don't start the envelope because the gate signal of C5 is still on. Therefore, the notes D sharp up to C6 don't have the adjusted envelope. They just start at that level which the envelope of C5 has reached in between. And they stop after being released. They are played by the VST because uh, in the MIDI to CV module there is the switch last note active, but a new envelope is not triggered. And now the same with the trigger signal fed into the re-trigger jack. Every note follows the envelope now, at least as long as the length of the note reaches.
to make it even clearer, I reduce the sustain to zero and play the sequence with and without re-triggering the envelope. Below the retrigger jack, there are two identical output jacks where you can take the envelope signal and lead it anywhere you want. The last jack is an output as well, but in inverted form. It's called inverse out. But don't misunderstand the meaning of inverted or inverse. It means indeed negative values. I engage a second ADSR to modulate the frequency to make sure you get the meaning. At first, one of the two normal outputs. And now inverse. Attached to the amplifier, the inverse output doesn't open, but close the gain of the amplifier. With a closed gain at the amplifier, you don't hear nearly anything when you hit a key, but when you open the amplifier's gain, the sound vanishes and increases according to your inverted envelope. And, at last, there is a little switch between the inverse output and the LED. We can switch between three overall speeds of the envelope. The standard setting is M for medium. Age means high, but not high speed, but high envelope length, what is very, very low speed. And L means low, and again, not low speed, but low envelope length, what is a very, very high speed. Somewhat confusing when you think of speed and see an H or an L, and the effect is just the opposite you have expected. But hmm, it's like always in life, if you know, your life is easy, if you don't, hmm, well, let me just demonstrate the difference. I'm going to use the pitch modulation again, in position H, proceeding through the envelope stages can last up to minutes, whereas we have to think of microseconds when we switch to position L.
Okay, so far for the pure functionality of the A140 ADS-R module. Let's talk about some details now. I told you the decay was not a level but a time. Well, it is not a level, of course. But it isn't really a time either. It's more a speed than a time. Look at the two graphs. The decay knob is adjusted to the same value in both graphs. The difference is only in the sustain level. If decay were a time, this time, the time the envelope develops down from maximum to sustain level, would be equal with both sustain levels, therefore. But it isn't. The bigger the difference of the two levels which the decay phase has to bridge, the longer the decay time lasts. Decay is a speed, therefore. If you drive the same speed and go from New York to LA, you will need a longer time than going from Brooklyn to Manhattan only. Well, depends on the traffic sometimes. Um, in the graphs, the decay knob adjustment corresponds with the angle of the decay curve, not its length. Let me prove that. <clears throat> Sorry. Please look at the clock measuring seconds and centiseconds. I'll stop the clock when the pitch stops descending. And it's proved. The higher the sustain level is, where decay has to get to, the shorter the time of decay. And with the release, it's inversely proportional. The higher the sustain level is, where release has to descend from, the longer it takes with the same release adjustments. Well, sustain level. Let's talk about sustain level. Let's talk about sustain level and maximum. Maximum level of the whole envelope, to be precise. Is the maximum sustain level with the knob completely to the right, to 10, identical with the maxi uh, maximum level attack rises up to and decay comes down from? In other words, the maximum level of the envelope? Is the graph you see correct, therefore? And you may have expected it, it is not. The envelope moves up to its maximum and moves down from there to the sustain level, which is at maximum 10, but which is lower than the envelope's culminating point. The right graph would read as is shown now, therefore, with a small peak between the end of 
attack at the beginning of the sustain phase. But what about the decay's speed? Is there a difference with different decay adjustments and sustain at maximum? Well, there isn't. The difference in centiseconds we have seen is caused by the inaccuracies of the process of measuring. And don't forget, I measured in H position and the difference was just some centiseconds. By the way, have you recognized how nicely the light of the ADSR's LED gets slowly brighter or fades slowly away according to the envelope? All right, there are some question marks to solve. Do you remember? In other words, what is the minimum level to initiate the ADSR, the gate signal from the MIDI to CV module produces the uh, equivalence to plus 5 volts, but what about lower voltages? What about sources and what sources at all, what signals can initiate the ADSR? Well, first, Question first. <laughs> we need at least the equivalent of plus 3 volt. Therefore, we should be able to start an envelope by pressing the higher notes of the keyboard. Please remember, the MIDI to CV module's note output has a 1 volt per octave characteristic. So, playing higher notes, which we feed into the gate of the ADSR, should initiate the envelope. Let's try it. Indeed, we can use every signal coming from the MIDI to CV module as long as it is strong enough, meaning it reaches 3 volt or more. The trigger signal would do, but as it is a very short one, the envelope is also extremely short. Or velocity. or the wheels, for example, the modulation wheel. Even a second amplifier can initiate the envelope only to spur your fantasy.
Well, enough of that. There are some other aspects left to talk about. We have triggered the ADSR by an LFO at the beginning of this video. Why not the other way around and modulating the LFO's frequency by an ADSR? But we are already a little too far into patching now, so just a short further note. Try a simple noise module with different ADSR adjustments and you will get a huge amount of different percussive sounds. My last matter is somewhat into patching as well, but the main question is, what about combining more ADSR modules? As I'm going to limit the number of combined envelope generators to only two of them, there are two possible schemes, parallel and serial. I'll begin with a parallel arrangement and feed the outputs of the ADSRs into a CV mixer module and take care to set the input level and output to 1. No amplification, no attenuation. Let me start with attack only. The upper ADSR is set to a quite short attack of 5, the lower ADSR is set to maximum attack. And again, it is also the pitch I am going to modulate to make things better noticeable. Hey, that's kind of different from what I've expected. Mm, of course. I must not forget the fact that in the CV mixer the level of both incoming signals are added up. Therefore the maximum level of the ADSR of the envelope is reached quite fast at the beginning when both ADSRs deliver a rising attack signal with both signals being added so that neither of the two ADSRs has reached the maximum, its individual maximum, but the summed output already has. The signal sustains at this summed up maximum for a short moment until the upper ADSR has reached maximum attack and falls back to a level of zero. Then the sum of the signals falls back to that level which the attack of the lower ADSR has in between reached. The lower ADSR's attack is at maximum after some time. It takes the time until, again, the whole signal has reached maximum level, this time only caused by the lower ADSR. And after that, the overall level falls back to zero. Hey, quite complex, isn't it? But can you already imagine what wonderfully crazy envelopes we can construct combining some ADSR modules? But let's go a little deeper into our actual patch. I reduce the output of the mixer to 50% so that the sum of the two ADSR signals never gets higher than the maximum level, the dark yellow arrows in the graph. Now the sum, the overall level, is as a single ADSR could it produce. But of course the shape of the envelope isn't. The more complex an envelope we create, the more stages the envelope has, the more important 
um, does the H mode of the ADSRs get? The number of stages you can create, you can add to an envelope is theoretically unlimited. But the more stages an envelope has, the shorter the individual stages are. So that this technique is useful mainly with long overall envelopes of uh, the H mode. Think, for example, of long developing soundscapes and so on. And you can, of course, operate the individual ADSRs in different modes, some delivering shorter envelopes in M or even L mode, some delivering long ones in H mode. And the last note, please keep in mind that there are also these nice inverse outputs of the ADSRs. I haven't used decay, sustain and release of the two RD, uh, ADSRs yet, and I won't in this video. You could spend weeks only designing envelopes. Well, by the way, the more I think about it, the more intriguing does the idea get, the idea of starting a second series, only about patching with this VST. Okay, you will have got the principle of parallel working ADSRs. Let me produce a serial arrangement of two ADSRs now. Well, I think that's not as complex as is the parallel arrangement. There isn't anything going on at the output of the second ADSR as long as the first ADSR hasn't reached the level of plus 3 volts, which is the minimum level for an ADSR to start its envelope, as we saw earlier in this video. Then, as long as the first ADSR puts out a level of not less than those plus 3 volts, the second ADSR proceeds through its stages proceeds through the stages of its envelope. I'll show the graphs adjustments in real life now, but I switch the first ADSR to H mode, because otherwise those plus 3 volts are reached so fast that the stage of waiting for the second ADSR to start working isn't nearly noticeable. You see, the first ADSR, the left one, acts only as a switch, switching the other, the second ADSR, on and off. That's all. Well, that's more or less everything I wanted to tell you and to show you everything, well, but for a little patch. There are three different ADSRs at work. The first, completely to the left, modulates the pulse width of the VCO with a quite short attack and short decay. It shall mimic the kind of tuning in which, for example, all brass instruments need to find its spectrum. The second one, the ADSR in the middle, modulates the volume with a long attack. And the third one, completely at the right, modulates the cut-off frequency of the filter with a medium attack. As none of the ADSRs is re-triggered, you get different sounds with shorter notes playing legato or playing staccato. Let me add some external reverb to it and play some notes. <laughs> you for watching. The next part of this series about soft tubes modular is going to deal with the VCLFO. There is a website of mine at www.rowfilm-medianet where you will find more information about this series of tutorials and about the modular. 
you can also download all drafts and graphics of this tutorial from there. There is also a forum there, the Deep Sound Divers Coffee House, where you can discuss my videos. Please, let's make this forum a living thing. Please consider liking, sharing and subscribing. And if you really liked this video, please think about donating a little to help me making more videos like this one. Have a great day and a good time, Rolf.